Matthew Weaver Jr. was, like many 21-year-old young men, at a crossroads in his life in 2018. He had recently broken up with his longtime girlfriend, Vanessa, and had just moved into a new apartment in Granada Hills, California. Granada Hills, an L.A. suburb, is just a short drive from Matthew's hometown in Simi Valley. On August 9th, 2018, Matthew went to a party with a girl, Melissa Sanchez. They partied all night drinking and possibly doing cocaine, and then Matthew dropped Melissa off at home around 5 o'clock a.m. He would then go driving around posting some Snapchat photos while he did so. At 11.58, August 10th, he would send a final mysterious text message to a friend stating something crazy was happening and he wanted to talk while he had the chance. Matthew would never be seen or heard from again. Where is Matthew Weaver Jr.? And welcome back to the Where Are They podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Wild Art Gallery in Austin, Texas, one of my favorite show sponsors to date. More info to come on them shortly. So this episode of Matthew Weaver Jr. is one that I have personally followed since it happened back in 2018. He was featured on an episode of The Missing on the ID channel, and he was covered on a couple of podcasts a while back, including To Live and Die in L.A., who did a bonus episode on him, which I have not listened to yet, and John Lorden, who covered his story on his YouTube channel, which I did watch a while back. I decided to tell Matthew's story myself because coverage seemed to have died down quite a bit over this last year. And I think this case is solvable, no matter what happened to Matthew. And there are a variety of theories and possibilities, but I think we can find him. Someone can find him. Or someone knows where he is. Either way, it's time to get his story out there once again. What's also interesting about this case is that there is an opportunity for you to help at home, no matter where you are located. They have a Dropbox file and a website where they have posted over 700 drone photos, and they're asking everyone to go through the photos and see if you notice anything out of the ordinary. I think this is a fantastic way to get some of these rural cases some help from a ton of people really across the world. So let's look at the case of Matthew Weaver Jr., and then we'll see how we can all help in this search. Who was Matthew Weaver Jr.? In 2018, Matthew was just 21 years old. He was one of four children in his family. I believe he was the second oldest. So when he vanished, he left behind siblings who cared for him very much, including two that were even younger than him. He grew up in the Simi Valley area of California, about an hour northwest of Los Angeles. Despite being near a big city, if you are unfamiliar with the area, Simi Valley sits right next to the Santa Monica Mountains, which consists of the Malibu Canyon area and many parks that have desolate mountains, hiking trails, cliffs, and just an overall rough and steep terrain. Matthew was known to be an animal lover and especially a dog lover, rescuing dogs every chance he could get. You'll see a lot of his photos online are taken with dogs in them, so you can see his love for animals. He had also talked about doing more traveling, and he one day hoped to travel the world, according to friends and family. Matthew had been dating a girl named Vanessa for a while, but they would break up in 2018, and Vanessa would later say that after their breakup, 
Matthew started drinking more and his overall behavior seemed to change. In April of 2018, Matthew moved out of his grandmother's home where he had been staying and moved into his own apartment in Granada Hills. Granada Hills is just about 20 minutes west of Simi Valley. That summer, he also began working with his father, Matthew Weaver Sr., in which he worked on telephone poles. On August 9th, 2018, which I believe was a Thursday, Matthew drove his silver BMW over to his boss's house to retrieve his paycheck or some money that was owed to him, possibly, about $400. Some reports state that this was his paycheck, but the boss gave him cash, so I'm not sure if he advanced him money or owed him money, but the boss did indeed give him $400. Later on that evening, Matthew went to his dad's house for a visit, and while he was there, he asked his dad if he could see his gun. His dad and Matthew were looking at the gun when Matthew Jr. took a picture of it and posted it to Snapchat with the caption, Game Over. Around 9 o'clock p.m., he calls up his friend, Melissa Sanchez, and he picks her up, and they go to Walmart, the gas station, And eventually, according to Melissa, they go out and buy some drugs, supposedly cocaine and marijuana. They would spend the evening driving around and partying and for a long time just stayed parked outside Melissa's house. Melissa would later say that Matthew became emotional during that drive and started crying, which was awkward for her as she said she barely knew him. At 5 o'clock a.m., Matthew dropped her off at her apartment. We know his exact whereabouts for the next few hours because he was posting to Snapchat regularly, which would capture his location each time. At 5.15 a.m., Matthew turns off the 101 highway in Calabasas and onto the Mulholland Parkway. At 5.34 a.m., he turns onto Stunt Road and drives for about 10 to 11 minutes. Stunt Road is really in the heart of the Santa Monica Mountains. He stops near the intersection of Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road. There's a parking lot there and a popular lookout in that area. Vanessa, Matthew's ex-girlfriend, said that that was always a favorite spot of Matthew's. He loved to drive the mountain roads, sometimes way too fast, and he loved to stop and take pictures at the lookouts. Nearby this area, there is a parking lot where you can park and take the popular Topanga Lookout Trail. And it's worth mentioning, this is a very popular hiking spot, and the trail takes you to a beautiful overlook that has ocean views. However, that is not the trail Matthew would go on that morning. Off of the parking lot, in the general area of the trailhead, however, there is an access road that is blocked off by a large metal gate. The gate is supposedly kept locked and access is limited to employees only, Matthew somehow opens the gate and drives his car through, and there's a few things I want to mention about this. Number one, his car is seen on surveillance camera going through the gate, and his car is the only one seen going through. And number two, while it's said to be a locked gate, a YouTube investigator did a video, you can check him out at Immortal Investigations, in which he retraced the steps of Matthew and tried to open the gate himself. He noted that there were several locks on the gate. However, he was able to swing it open. So while there were a lot of questions on how Matthew opened the gate, I think we can fairly say that it probably was not properly locked. And number three, there are a bunch of private property signs and no trespassing signs in that area. They are hard to miss but none of them stopped Matthew from driving down that road. Okay, so Matthew continues to drive down this narrow asphalt road until he reaches a fork. He takes the fork in the road that eventually turns to dirt and becomes way too narrow for a car to even drive down. 
There are also large rocks, almost like boulders, and the terrain is really steep. It's no place for a car. People said that if a car somehow got down there, there was absolutely no way to turn around and come back up the road. It simply would be impossible. So here's Matthew driving down this winding and twisting path with rocks and boulders and uneven terrain and drop-offs all along the way. And then the road comes to a dead end, and Matthew's car gets stuck on a boulder. No one knows this quite yet, however. Around 8 a.m., Matthew tries calling his father, but his dad doesn't answer. No one would hear anything from Matthew until 11.58 a.m. when he calls his friend Melissa, the same friend he had spent the evening with the night before. She doesn't answer because she is at work, but she does text him back, and here is their text exchange. Melissa, I'm at work, what's up? Matthew, just like some crazy shit is going on. Matthew, I just to talk while I have the chance. After this, his phone either dies or is turned off. Melissa texts him back about an hour later, asking him if he is okay, but he never responds. The next day, a full 24 hours later, the Calabasas Police Department receives a call that someone had heard cries of distress in the area. The report stated that someone heard a male and a female calling out for help. Police did go to the area to investigate, but they didn't find anyone. However, they did come across Matthew's car abandoned. They ran the plates for the car and learned that it was registered to Matthew Weaver Sr., so they reached out to him, and it was then they realized that Matthew was missing. The family started checking with each other and with friends and realized no one had seen him for a couple of days. So the police found the car 24 hours after it had apparently been abandoned. But what's kind of odd is that this area is known to be a popular hiking area and a party area. Even though Matthew was on an area that was not meant for cars, it's apparently a popular hiking area nearby and locals have a hard time believing that the car wasn't spotted there or reported earlier. The family immediately began searching for Matthew desperately. They believe he was out there and likely needed help. And the search leads to nothing at first. The police tell the family they will bring in helicopters to search from above, but they later learn that they did not do that. And their reason? Because there was no evidence a crime had been committed. And this makes me wonder, we send out search and rescue for lost hikers all the time, and they use helicopters and infrared technology for that. So why not, in Matthew's case, just because there was no evidence of a crime? Did they just not want to? Were they unable to? Or is that a Calabasas policy? Melissa Sanchez, the girl he was last known to be with, posted an odd Snapchat eight days after Matthew disappeared. The Snapchat would have internet sleuths wondering if there wasn't more going on here, possibly involving Melissa. Melissa posted a video on Snapchat talking about how stupid everyone was for thinking that she knows anything. People have commented that she shows no emotion and little regard for Matthew during this video. Then, at the end, she says, quote, I ain't capable of all that. That's a whole ass body. End quote. The fact that she references Matthew as a body has a lot of people looking at her suspiciously. That, along with the fact that she was the last person with him and the last person Matthew contacted via text, does raise some eyebrows. Months go by with no sign of Matthew. And then, in January of 2019, a hiker finds Matthew's BMW car key just 25 yards from where his car had been. I can't imagine how that was missed during a search, but it was. 
Matthew Sr., continuing to search the area, comes across pieces of a torn up white t-shirt with possibly some blood on it, and he believed it might have been Matthew's. The police have yet to test it for any DNA. The Weaver family brought in someone to fly a drone over the area and take photos that they could review later. The area is covered in brush, and with all the steep terrain and drop-offs, I think that was a brilliant idea. They posted all the photos, all 797 of them, to their website and asked the public for help looking through them to see if there was anything that stood out or anything that might be a clue that they could use in their search for Matthew. And one person who did look at those photos found something interesting, something that looked like a red hat. So the family went out to look in this particular area and they found Matthew's red Los Angeles Angels baseball hat. And while we aren't 100% sure if the white t-shirt belongs to Matthew, there are several pictures of Matthew wearing this hat. So even if the police don't bother to test it, we can probably presume it is his. You yourself can view all of these photos at matthewweaver.tips. Many local people went out to search the area, and although there are a lot of thick brush areas and difficult places to get to, the area is still a popular hiking and visiting spot. And yet here we are in 2021 with still no sign of Matthew. Now let's look at all the theories and talk about the questions within each one. Theory number one, suicide. After reading through Reddit and web sleuth threads on Matthew's case, it seems about half of the people out there believe Matthew likely committed suicide. Matthew was distraught. He had ended a long-term relationship recently. And to further agitate things, he had been drinking and possibly doing drugs. This could have all put him in a state of mind that led to suicidal thoughts. And what better place to do it than a place that he was familiar with and a place that he loved. So was this his goal while driving down that road, the road that was not meant for cars? Was he hoping to just drive off of a cliff? And then when that failed or when his car got stuck instead, he walked off into the wilderness to end it some other way, possibly? But again, if that's the case, how did he do it? It's unknown if he had a gun with him. And there's also the question of that last text he sent to Melissa. What did it mean? Some thought it meant that he was in trouble and needed help, but perhaps it didn't mean that at all. Maybe the drugs made it sound more ominous than it was. And my last question on this theory, if he did indeed commit suicide, where is he? How has he not been found? Despite it being a rural and rugged area, there have been numerous searches by family and volunteers. And it's been three years, three years of searching, and yet there has still been no sign of Matthew. Theory number two, an accident. Was Matthew not in his right frame of mind and therefore had an accident? Did the drugs cause him to hallucinate? We can't be 100% sure what Matthew was doing that night. We only have the word of Melissa Sanchez. If he crashed his car there on accident, maybe he wandered off, especially when he couldn't reach his dad. It's believed that his car got stuck around the same time he called his dad, 8 o'clock in the morning. Then there was a three-hour time span before he messaged Melissa that something crazy was going on. Maybe it was the drugs playing tricks on his mind, or maybe it wasn't. But if he did wander off, he might have succumbed to the elements, especially if he was in a bad state. The Santa Monica Mountains are vast, but again, it's an area that has been searched many times. With all the growth and brush in the area, many people do believe he could be in an area which he just hasn't been discovered yet. And if he did die out there due to an accident, there are wild animals that could make the search for Matthew even more difficult. 
It was also recorded to be 98 degrees during that day on August 10th. So it was a hot one. And if Matthew didn't have any water with him, he could have suffered from dehydration or heat stroke. Some friends did come forward during the investigation and told the family that Matthew had suffered a head injury a few days before, and they believe that he might have been acting erratically as a result of that injury. The family had been totally unaware of this, and it's really not clear how he sustained this injury. But if this is true, it could have certainly affected his thinking. This is probably the theory that leaves me with the least amount of questions, but I do wonder what he meant by that text message he sent to Melissa. And if it was indeed the drugs talking. To be honest, I wonder about the drug story at all, but until we find Matthew, we might never know. I'm also really curious about this head injury and if it could have been severe enough to really affect his ability to think. And if it was that severe, is it odd that he didn't tell his family about it? So theory number three. Matthew met with foul play. For as many people online that believe Matthew's disappearance was a suicide, there are about as many that believe it was foul play. For one, everyone says that Matthew was not suicidal. He had just picked up his money. He had gotten his own apartment. And even if he had started drinking and dabbling in drugs, those close to him don't believe he committed suicide. They point to that eerie text message that Matthew sent to Melissa stating that something crazy was going on. While no one else was seen on camera going through that gate, could Matthew have stumbled upon something out there that he shouldn't have? It was a known party area, and in fact, if you Google up some images of the area, a lot of the large boulders and rocks are painted and covered with graffiti. The family has recounted that early on, when they were conducting searches out there, the men that were working on the tower that was nearby were exceptionally rude to them, and just overall mean and odd which is definitely weird. I don't know why you would be mean to a family who was out there searching for their son in a popular hiking area. A lot of people wonder if there were workers out there when Matthew was out there and something happened to him involving them. This is a tough one. If he did meet with foul play, however, that would explain why he hasn't been found. Someone or someones possibly took him from the area or hid his body exceptionally well. And could this be related to Melissa in any way? Her Snapchat was also very odd, referring to Matthew as a body. I'd be curious to know if the surveillance camera was strong enough to pick up if anyone else was in the car with Matthew when he went through that gate. In any missing person case, especially with adults, we have to consider the fact that he left on his own accord, although no one considers this to be the case. But until we have an answer, I suppose it's possible. No one has come forward to say that they have seen him. I also feel that when people do this, most of the time it's temporary, and family will eventually hear from them, at the very least to let them know that they are okay. I think it's a long shot, but stranger things have happened. Another theory that is talked about in conjunction with the foul play theory is the possibility of a serial killer. I know we've talked about the Malibu Canyon killings and disappearances here before, particularly in the case of Elaine Park, but we actually have had several disappearances in this area that lead people to wonder if they are in any way connected. Law enforcement also doesn't believe any of these cases are related, but that doesn't stop people from wondering. Tristan Baudet was murdered as he lay sleeping next to his two young daughters on June 22, 2018, while on a camping trip in the Malibu Canyon area. Anthony Rod, a parolee at the time, was convicted of that crime. Matrice Richardson, who went missing on September 17th, 2009, was found deceased on August 9th, 2010. 
She was missing for 11 months before being found deceased in August of 2010 by park rangers. This is a case in and of itself with a lot of weird elements and definitely leaning towards foul play. However, law enforcement would rule it as an accidental death. Her family would file many lawsuits against the city and the county. And, of course, the case of Elaine Park, who remains missing to this day as well. Her car was found abandoned on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu after leaving her boyfriend's house in Calabasas. The drive between the two places occurs right through the Malibu canyons. Elaine has been missing since January 28, 2017. When you look into one of these cases, the other two are likely to pop up as well as people often connect them. They all happened in the same general area. And there are more, and you can certainly easily find a list of missing and murdered people in the Malibu Canyon area by searching it. And this is what fuels the conspiracy theory that something else is going on out there. However, it is a rural and rugged area that could invite crime or be prone to disappearances just because of the topography of the mountains and canyons. So what do you think happened to Matthew Weaver? Matthew is described as a Caucasian male, 21 years old, when he vanished in 2018. He stood about 5 foot 9 inches tall and was estimated to be around 160 pounds. He was wearing a plain black or white t-shirt, black Dickies pants, red shoes, and a Los Angeles Angels baseball cap, which has since been believed to have been recovered. Matthew has a tattoo of the name Jeremiah in script lettering over some swirls on the left side of his chest. You can view the photos of the area in which the family had taken and posted at matthewweaver.tips. And I urge you to follow them on Facebook and or Instagram also to show your support for the family. Their page is titled Help Find Matthew Weaver Jr. They are offering a $50,000 reward for information that leads them to Matthew. And they also have a GoFundMe set up, which I will link in the show notes. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of Matthew Weaver, please contact the Los Angeles Police Missing Persons Unit at 213-996-1800. Thank you all so much for listening to Matthew's story. I know it's had some coverage in the past, but as it's been three years, it seems the buzz in the media has slowed down in this case, and we really need to reinvigorate it. His family keeps active on social media and continues to hold vigils and searches in the area for Matthew. Please share Matthew's story if you can, and please go check out those photos of the area to look through them yourself. You never know when something might stand out to you. I also want to give a huge shout out to the Wild Art Gallery for sponsoring this episode. You can browse their gallery of Native American art at wild.gallery. That's W-Y-L-D dot gallery and find some cool and original holiday gifts. We will, of course, be back again next week with another episode of Where Are They? And until then, stay safe and hug your loved ones.